What up? It is I, your parole verbal boy, Jeffy, coming at you from San Francisco, California. I just spent the past weekend in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I conducted a free tour and a boot camp where much edification and love was had by all. Basically, we got a group of individuals who attended this program who are going to go forward in their lives inspired, believing that this stuff is real, right? I live this to an obnoxious degree. And moreover, they can do it too. Regular people can learn this stuff too and be very, very successful in their social interactions going forward. Um, however you want to quantify that. <laughs> and I uh, am giving you the tools so that you can go forward in your life and actually um, be successful at this. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to travel again and conduct these programs. You know, the free tour was also great. Great to see everyone come out for that and, and get back into the swing of those things again. Um, I've got upcoming programs in Austin, Texas next week, Las Vegas, San Diego, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and much more. Go to jeffyinperson.com right now if you want to actually be a part of these wonderful programs and change your life. So uh, having said that though, I'm gonna crack into a clip from Phoenix Free Tour that I shot this past weekend. I've been teaching this stuff live in the field for 20 years, right? Where people are like, okay, demonstrate. And I have to actually go up and do it. It's not just some armchair theory stuff. This is all based and concerned with pragmatic reality, right? So when I talk about this stuff, I'm bringing the truth, right? This isn't some, again, I'm not just, I know I'm on this green screen in a studio here, but I, I'm not like a lot of these other channels where it's just some random, like well quaffed dude spouting something he read in a book. This is real talk. So if you wanna see this kind of content keep coming, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe so you can get this real talk coming at you on a weekly basis. Tension is the enemy. Like the overarching tenet when you're trying to work in your vibe is physical tension and intellectual density-based tension is tension is the enemy. Because what you're trying to do when we're talking about creating a vibe, you're trying to basically let go and allow the synergistic wisdom of the whole to take over, so to speak, right? You're trying to hit a flow state. In other words, you, have you ever hit the, you guys know what flow state is? Where you just kind of like lose track of intellectual monitoring and you're just sort of hitting, hitting the notes. You do no wrong. Yeah, er, your responses are, are immaculate. The timing is perfect. Everything you say is gold. Every move you make is, is perfectly balanced. Be, because you're, you're tapping into a deeper subconscious process. See, most people, the problem with the ego and the, the intellect, the intellect is just one part of the so-called human energy system, right? Again, you got the face, the voice, the body, the mind, the emotional process, intuition, higher observer, universal energy that comes down through and out. Now, when we're talking about energy, I mean, we know through, I mean, it sounds kind of like crystal healing or something like that. But in fact, you know, we know from quantum mechanics, from Einstein, all matter is just energy in different kind of vibrational states. So, you know, a rock, a sunbeam are on the same spectrum of energy. But generally, the more dense something is, the less receptive it's going to be to higher energies. In other words, a rock is less receptive to that sunbeam than a leaf would be. So again, when we're thinking about going up and you creating this like very compelling, very fascinating, very interesting vibe that cuts the RAS in a loud environment where there's music, lights, alcohol, dancing, the friends, other people fighting for their attention, and you're gonna go up and they're gonna be like, stop, oh no, no, this is what I need to pay attention to here. The RAS, what, again, the reticular activating system, which scans the environment, scans all of the sensory input being received and filters out that which is unnecessary to process. Again, it, it, it's scanning for danger or difference or something unique. This is, again, RAS, and if you followed us for any length of time, you're probably familiar with this idea. I mean, there's a massive amount of sensory information being fed to you at all times, right? Um, you only process stuff that's relevant. It, otherwise, you'd be like overwhelmed, you know, like, you know, like Peter Parker or something, you know, Spidey sense. So, for example, I, I live on a very busy street. All night, there's motorcycles going by, people peeling out, um, sirens, fire trucks, drunk homeless people screaming. I live in San Francisco, probably defecating as right after they uh, shoot themselves up. 
Um, I don't, I, I, I will sleep through all of that. I've even had like somebody crash, a drunk driver crash into my car, parked out front, and I didn't wake up until the doorbell rang and the, and the cops were there. Like your car is wrecked. Because those noises are unimportant. The doorbell is important. I hear the doorbell. I hear my alarm. I'll wake up immediately to my alarm. All that other nonsense, I don't because it's RAS. So if you want to be, make yourself relevant enough in that loud nightlife environment, you've got to bring something. You've got to bring a vibe that's, again, something different. Is it interesting? Is it fascinating? Is it compelling? Is it threatening? Is it outrageous? Is it hilarious? Is it something as opposed to what? What's up? What's up? It's just not going to cut the mustard, yo, as the saying goes. So you, you've got to understand that. You've got, you have to learn how to bring that. And how do you do that? Again, there's a lot, like I said, there's these, you have to, under, number one, understand the model of what's going on inside you as you try to communicate. I think that most people, myself included at, at many points, previously, you, we view our communication as, as this sort of like generalized whole. Right, this sort of gestalt, like, okay, I'm, I, I, I talk. I go up and I just go, hey, and I, I talk, right? In reality, there are all these little subsystems that are combining to form the total instrument. So your face, again, what is being, what is being sent by the face? And these can be different. What you're saying and, and what you're facially expressing can be very, very different. Right? Another thing too, like here's an interesting thing, gestures by themselves have no inherent meaning. Right? So phys physically, kinesthetically, if I go like this, what am I expressing here? Anger. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Beat LA. Right? <laughs> this is the SF thing. Uh, so you don't know. Again, that, that fist in the air, that's a powerful, that's a powerful statement a powerful energy statement, but you don't know what's being conveyed until the context, is, until it's given additional context by the face, the context of the situation, maybe some vocalization. Again, you don't know if, if they're cheering or if they're about to punch someone in the face. If you see somebody, like a, per, a, a man crouched in tension around a corner, like waiting to spring out from around the corner, you don't know if he's gonna surprise his wife or if he's gonna murder somebody, like until it actually happens, so it's given that context. So it, it's interesting to think about all of these different parts. We usually don't. We just think expression and communication. So in order to like gain a master, and you don't have to be a master of everything, you just have to do what you can as best you, as best you can. And, and then, so number one, identify, so, so for example, I'm just going back. So we got again, the face, the voice, the body, the mind, the emotions, intuition. Now, the, here's the problem, the intellect, very often it has elevated itself to this position of authority where it, it believes it should control everything. Like it knows what's best, it knows how to control everything. It should control the face, it can control the voice, it can control the body. But here's the thing, it, it is not, very often it's not equipped to handle these very energies that it's put itself in charge of. Like how the hell is your, your intellect, your cognitive working space going to be the boss of intuition, which is essentially trolling many constellations of different memories that are not consciously available to you at the time to come up with suggestions of things to do and say. Intuition is not magic. It's not magic, it's a subconscious process. Again, intellect can only work, can only work with what's available to it in the moment, right? With memories that it's purposefully brought forth into that cognitive working space, with what's going on in front of it, Intuition can work with information that is not consciously available to you. The problem is most people don't trust it. They don't trust it, right? It's been given short shrift. It's like everything must be analyzed. It must be analyzed before I say it. But the problem, again, as we said before, the problem is there's no time out for you to evaluate the potential usefulness. There's no time out in the interaction. So the moment passes and either you don't say it at all or you say it and there's this kind of second guessing yourself uh, feel to it. So, so number one, like I said, it, it, in the mentoring, a lot of the exercises that we do, number one, are to diagnose the tension, right? Make it bigger so you can see it and you can say, okay, there it is. Because most of the time you're not even aware it's there. So once you're aware of it 
And once you start to get wrap your head around how all these different parts interact, you can isolate them, you can work them and strengthen them in isolation, and then you can put it all back together in a more completely realized whole. So, for example, with, with the, facial, the, the facial flexing. Number one, you'll identify where various tensions are coming up when you're trying to express the face. Great, I identify those, I can start releasing them. Number two, you then expand the range of, of, of expressive choices that you can make. This doesn't mean that you're supposed to go out and now you're, you're, <laughs> you're gonna be like this Jim Carrey in the mask, you know, making all these wacky faces, but you could, you could. Now, when you can, then you don't need to. The thing is, the person who can't make a wide range of expressive choices, whether kinesthetically, vocally, facially, whatever, imaginatively, the person who cannot, if all you can do is just express on a very low level, then you're, you're pretty much powerless. And, and, and you have, that's when it's very off-putting and, and boring, et cetera, et cetera. When you have the ability to express, express in a very wide range, you don't need to. So I, I think the best way to put it is, Individual choices that you make gain power in direct proportion to the larger field of choice potential surrounding them. Does that make sense? So say, for example, I'm sitting here next to uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov, like the, the best ballet dancer ever, or like LeBron James, like some, some superstar athlete. We can both be sitting in, the, in a state of like rest, but LeBron is going to be exuding a greater sense of power around his state of rest due to the larger range of kinesthetic choice that he has, right? Even at rest, you can tell this guy can do more. He has that readiness to do more. So this is why myself, Owen, we can go up and we can, we can go up and say, hey, what's up? What's your name? You're beautiful. Where do you live? What's your address? When are you home? You know, <laughs> because they, they can tell, like, even if we're they're like, oh, this guy's making a proactive decision to kind of be more chilled out, right? They, they could, they can sense that it, it, we're not confined in that, right? So number one, you identify tensions. Number two, you release them. Number three, you expand the range and then you don't need to do it, right? And then here's the thing too. When you go out, like, so, so when I do mentoring, this is not, it, there's, it's a different side of the coin, right? There's a huge difference between exercise and performance. When we're exercising these things, I don't want people when they go out to even be thinking about this stuff, right? You're not going to be like, okay, how is my kinesthetic now? How is my vocal? You're like, no, you exercise that in isolation and then you, you leave it all, you leave it at the door and then, and then, you know, you, you go out. So basically like, look, in exercise, you practice what you can't do in performance. You allow what you can when, when necessary by the, when deem, when you deem it necessary for the situation. Um, a, a different analogy I always like to use is imagine, you know, a football player and then this, this guy, he might lift weights in the gym. He might run through tires, you know, in a grid on, on the field in practice. He's not going to do either of those things in the actual game, but both of those things will improve his ability to perform in the actual game. So when I, again, I got sick of seeing these students who just could not vibe. So I developed a pragmatic exercise process for them to work on it. And once you know it, you have these understandings, you can keep working on that, you know, at home for the rest of your life or as much as you feel you need to, like working on imagination, working on, on this, that, and the next thing. And then you can take that into the field and then apply technique to that. So if you get the vibe and technique, that's when you're lethal. That's when you're, it's just like, it seems so effortless. It seems like nothing. It seems like it, it ceases to be this chore, this try, uh, trying, chore where you must put yourself through, through the fire. And honestly, you know, I used to, my programs used to really be like that. When I first started, it was really, you're being put through this, again, trial by fire. You're being broken down to be built up, elbows in the mud. You're going through the fire, you know, all these kind of like very dramatic analogies. And I, I realized, number one, a lot of people don't do, I mean, yes, let me put it this way. Even today, I still, like for you who is on the program, you will be pushed very hard. You will be pushed very hard. Like there will be no hiding in the restroom and crying. I will find you. <laughs> I will, <laughs> and I will make you approach. Yeah, I will find you and I will make you approach. Like Liam Neeson. <laughs> I'm about as old as him, shit. So, um, 
but <laughs> we'll have to like edit the <laughs> yeah jump cuts as I'm like doing the approach. Uh, but but yeah, but like now there's there's like a there's like a feeling like I want my program I want there to be a feeling of like warmth and ease and creativity and playfulness and and adventure. You know what I mean? As opposed to oh, it's this big problem that we're trying to fix and it, you know because it, it, it gives it too much weight you know what i mean and i think that so much of our education is like that it, it's like this dichotomy pass fail right wrong you know up down it, it's this dualism and so again i wanted to create a space on the program that's very non-judgmental and look it is i'll tell you one thing after 20 years you're not going to be the best person i ever seen and you're not gonna be the worst person I've ever seen either. I can tell that right now, because I can't smell you from here. Um, you wouldn't believe some of the people that come on these programs, uh, the way they smell. Um, you would think that uh, they, you know, they could shell out the resources for the, the program. They could also afford deodorant or a toothbrush, but evidently that's not the case. But you're not gonna be the best, you're not gonna be the worst. I'm not concerned with that. Um, I mean, I think that this, these programs, I really wanna make it a place where Again, a non-judgmental space where you can make that leap through fear into the unknown, where, where you get growth, right? Again, a, a quote that I heard recently that I really liked is all learning is movement into the unknown, right? And the fear will always be there to an extent. The fear of speaking to someone will always be there. It will never go away. Even when I go out to this day, 20 years deep, when I first enter the, the, you know, the environment, I'll feel like a slight reluctance to go to do the first introduction. I'll, I'll feel a reluctance to that. Why? Because the thing is, once these anxiety triggers are installed in the amygdala, they seem to be indelible. It, it seems like they can, to the best of our understanding, from a neuroscience standpoint, once a fear trigger has been installed, it cannot be removed. It cannot be removed. You can weaken the connections that the fire and cause those interference patterns to come into play. You can weaken those, but the thing is, it's kind of interesting. There's an asymmetry between the connections from the amygdala to the, the cortex and back. Like it's much stronger to the cortex and much weaker back down. So essentially what we're trying to do, when we're remember I said knowledge is not knowing. What we're doing here in this very room is we're employing the intellect in the process of transcending itself, right? We're, we're saying these words and these words you're like, Okay, I under, what, what do these words mean? What do these noises through the air mean? Okay, I'm processing that. This is what it means. Then you're gonna take it out, hopefully, <laughs> and actually practice. You're like, okay, then it becomes knowing. And then you can make it knowledge again and give it to someone else. But, but again, so we can cool those triggers off, but they're always gonna be there to some extent. But the only way to get past that fear is to do it. It's the only way to do it. And I would argue that the cumulative effect of not stepping up and going through the fear is far more damaging to you psychologically than actually stepping up and doing it. Take that into consideration. The fear, like the cumulative fear of ne not stepping up, not stepping up, not stepping up, because it's reinforcing in your mind what? I'm a punk ass. I, I fucking suck. I'm a loser. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened. I'm a cowardly individual. So I think that, look, you know, I think it was Patton who said, if the definition of of bravery as someone without fear, I've never met a brave person. All men feel fear, and the more intelligent you are, the more fear you're gonna feel, but courage is stepping up through that and finding something within you to move towards the perceived danger.